Okay, we're here with ROV, ROV. You know, he put in a lot of work in the city, as far as on the music, you know, and everything like that. We in the neighborhood you grew up in right now. We're gonna be talking to him today, basically about East 39th Street, but uh, this man is legendary. So uh, let's get to this. Uh, What's, up with What's up with What's it? What's up with it? Man, it feel good to be here, man. Right here where I grew up at, 39th Street area, the Seven Oaks area, man. You know what I'm saying? Place I call home, man, where I grew up, born and raised in the heart of the city. That's what's up. Yeah. All right, what was it like growing up on East 39th Street? Well, man, it was it was a totally different time than what it is now. You know what I'm saying? I'm an 80s baby, you know what I'm saying? So I was kind of coming of age during the early 90s, man. And, you know, my father died in 1993. And around that time, you know what I'm saying, I was introduced to, like, gangs and stuff in my neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? One of the first gangs I got introduced to was the 3-9 Posse. I think I was like, probably 13 years old, man. Just a bunch of guys in the, from a neighborhood, from the community, whether it's the Seven Oaks community, Holy Temple, niggas was just banded together and just on some knucklehead type shit. And I just kind of somehow figured out my way and wiggled in there, man, and that's what introduced me to that street life. And it just kind of started from there, but for the most part, you know, the 39th Street area, the Seven Oaks community, it was a close-knit community. You know, we had our own grocery store, which was Piggly Wiggly's, which was at once upon a time, the old, one of the oldest black-owned grocery stores in the United States. Family-owned uh, liquor store, family-owned uh, wash house. So everybody kind of knew each other. You know what I'm saying? Families was raised with each other. The neighbors knew each other. The kids knew who their elders were around the community and, and stuff like that. It was a lot more close-knit than what it is now. So yeah, it's a sense of community back then, you feel me? Yeah, yeah, that's what's up. So, um, <clears throat> tell me this, um, did you have to join a gang or associate with gangs to uh, survive when you were in the hood? No, nah, I wouldn't say that, you know what I'm saying? Most of the people that was, when I look back on my childhood and my youth growing up, you know what I'm saying? Most of the dudes that joined gangs was products of fatherless homes. So, you know, Dudes, the dudes had mamas that was trying their best to do whatever they could to maintain the home, and some of them had mamas that was on drugs that really was just kind of absent, and they was there to just fiend for themselves. So the, the gang activity came as like a sanctuary away from home. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't necessarily a form of survival. Most of the guys that I grew up with, grew up with, we kind of chose that. We came from pretty decent homes. You know what I'm saying? It was just the camaraderie that we had as, as young dudes growing up in the, in the neighborhood, and we just banded together, and you know, it just formed into a gang. You know what I'm saying? We had the California influence. We was wearing blue around here, so shit, niggas was crips. You know what I'm saying? And that's what it was. So it was more just like the people you was just growing up with. Absolutely, it absolutely. Wasn't, it wasn't like a gang. Or you know, it it, it 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 wasn't. You know, with the three nine posse, I remember, man. It was, it was a dude named Mark, man. You know what I'm saying? I seen them niggas walking on 39th and Inwood. I was a little kid. Niggas was about 15, 20 niggas deep. I'm like, damn, everybody had on white t-shirts and blue dickies and Cortez. And I'm like, flannels and shit. I'm like, damn, niggas, hood niggas. So niggas was high. Nigga hit the stop sign with his fist and that motherfucker start bleeding. And nigga was like, you down with three nine posse, nigga? You down with 3-9 Posse, and I'm such a, like, a naive young kid. I'm like, yeah. And the nigga was like, you down, nigga, shake my hand. I shook the nigga hand and took damn near like a blood off with the nigga. And shook the nigga hand, man, and I wiped the nigga blood on my shirt, bro. And I walked around with that shirt on for days. Like, it was an honorable thing. Yeah. So that was my way of being inducted into the, that was my first introduction and, and being, feeling like I was officially a part of something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But <clears throat> even the true int introduction came before that, because like I said, man, I, I grew up in a two-parent home. My father's well-known in this community. You know what I'm saying? Well respect. He was well respected in this community. Matter of fact, every March 30th is Gregory Taylor Day. He received a proclamation from at the time Mayor Cleaver, who's our United States Congressman right now. Uh, but anyway, when I was young, my father passed away. And niggas used to hang out on 39th and Kissington at this nigga named Fat Sean's house. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You remember that yeah, shit, yeah. right? So my brother was already, my big brother was already fucking around, going, you know, skipping school over there. 
and whatever he had going on, man, that shit seemed exciting. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Me going to school making straight A's and shit, that shit just wasn't enough. I, I wanted to participate in something more exciting, so one day I stole some weed from my mama, and um, I went over to that nigga house and I knocked on the door. And he opened up the door and he was like, hey, G-Lo, which is my brother, they like, Lil Rob is here. So my brother looked and he like, man, you need to go back home. And I'm like, man, fuck you. I can be over here too. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they welcomed me with open arms, everybody in the house, because nigga, I had that weed. I had that good weed back then, you know what I'm saying? Even as a little 13 year old little boy, niggas know it. I was standing on 39th and Jackson back then with that motherfucking pack, you feel me? Yeah. So, yeah, man. So the gang shit gave introduction to the drug dealing. The drug dealing and the gang shit gave introduction to police interaction, having run ins with detects and, and, and police officers and shit like that. That impacted the family dynamic. Mama, get the fuck out. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, a, it's a lot that came with it. You know what I mean? And thank God that I, I, I made it through that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I still got my yeah. fucking senses. Got a lot of crazy ass memories and some bad nightmares. But, you know, I smoke a little bit of pot and it'll be all right. Feel me? Yeah, that's what's up. <clears throat> so, uh, what you got to say about this uh, this faux Trey Nine thing? Was that ever a thing, or was that just some people talking stuff? Cause to this day, the other day I see somebody walking around with that on their on their jersey. Are you people, serious? Yeah. In two thousand twenty four, yeah. somebody had that. Yeah. Man, let me tell you something, man. And I'm and I'm being one hundred. All right. I grew up on thirty ninth in Norton. My address growing up was thirty nine nineteen Norton. You ask any nigga around here. When I was young, I, me and my brother started going to the Boys and Girls Club on 43rd in Cleveland. Yeah. It's still there to this day. Well, there was a whole nother crew of niggas up there, hanging out up there. They was the faux trade Crips. You know what I'm saying? But they interacted with the niggas from 39th Street because it's still the same neighborhood. It's still in close vicinity. They just was faux trade Crips. These niggas down here was Trey Nine, Seven Oaks Crips. Niggas down the street was Holy Temple, 39th Street Crips. So, me and my brother started interacting with these niggas. And they really introduced us to that hardcore Crip shit. The insane gangster Crips. The motherfucking, uh, all these different sectors of Crips. You know what I'm saying? It was them niggas up there that introduced us to that shit. So, we started repping Full Trade. But our roots was in 39th Street. So me and my brother had this wise idea and all the people that was around us, the young life, the young dudes that was coming up, the BGs, the baby gangsters, as niggas would call them in the 90s. We had this idea that we could merge the two neighborhoods together and call it Faux Trey Nine, bro. This was in the fucking early and mid 90s when we did this shit. Me and my brother and L Dog, uh, rest in peace to him, 50, rest in peace to 50, Abasi, all, all these dudes, uh, that we grew up with, Steve, Lil Boo Boo, all these niggas that we grew up with, we collectively was like, yeah, niggas, Faux Trey Nine. Now, it was some niggas that was older, they didn't like that shit. Niggas wanted to have their own sections. But we was growing up as young men, interacting, had a lot in common. We like, fuck it, it's Faux Trey Nine, nigga. And for years, that's what it was. So for that shit to evolve and still be around in 2024, it's impressive, I remember, you know, the whole thing with Five Ace Deuce yeah, when 51st yeah. Street and 12th Street, you know what I'm saying? They combined forces or whatever. I ain't gonna say combined forces, but niggas was in allegiance with each other. And then you had 6-8 Trey. Them niggas was in allegiance with each other, 68th and 33rd Street down mm -hmm. there. I don't know they politics. I just know that this this was the this was the, the, the how the how the streets was vibrating at certain points of time. You know what I'm saying? I'm just highlighting that so a nigga don't get it twisted and think like, that nigga think he knows something. I, I don't know nothing. Yeah. I don't know a goddamn thing besides what I know about myself. And I, you know what I'm saying? That's it. Yeah, that's what's up. So uh, do you feel like rappers have to be in a gang or, or associate with a gang to have a successful music career in 2024? Man, that's a good ass motherfucking question. And it's even doper that you ask it and put in 2024 at the end of it. You know what I'm saying? So it's going to make it a, a not so simple answer. Yeah. It's going to be kind of complex, right? So, first of all, I wrote my first rhyme in 1989, bro. And what inspired me was the fact that, you know, I was a little kid making good grades and writing poetry and shit. You know what I'm saying? 
but I was always infatuated with the imagery and the music associated with hip hop. You know what I'm saying? So I'm watching videos, I'm memorizing rap songs. Remember back in the day when we was kids, they only played rap music on one of three late at night yeah. on a Saturday. And you had to stay up, you know what I'm saying? So my mom and them like, what the hell are you doing up? I'm waiting on, I forget the name of the show. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to write Tony G or Sean Tyler on, on Facebook and ask one of them, but whatever. So I was infatuated with that shit. But what happened was when I would step out in my community and I would see the D-Boys, the, the, the killers of the world, the motherfucking Lonzos of the world, all these niggas mochas and all these niggas that were selling dope and getting money around this motherfucker and wearing jewelry and driving nice cars. They looked like the rappers that I looked up to. And but the rappers talked about what I knew what these niggas was doing. These was the niggas buying motherfucking ice cream and, and, and buying fire crack, extra firecrackers for niggas to light up on the 4th of July and all that old type of shit, right? So these was like the hood luminaries. These was niggas that niggas looked up to, just like you idolize a rapper. So I drew a correlation between the two and I found a sense of validation as a young kid engaging in motherfucking underworld behavior and being able to rap about it, knowing that it was the truth, I felt like it validated me. It validated my existence as a rapper, right? I thought you had you had to be with the shit in order to talk about it. Well, shit, man, that mentality landed me in federal prison. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it put me in a, it put me in a mindset where I made some bad decisions. You know what I'm saying? That I had to hold myself accountable for, and um. I'll, I'll tell you this, if there's a young rapper out there that feels like that he has to engage in the madness in order to have validation in 2024, he's under, he's a slave to an illusion. He, he, he doesn't, he doesn't understand his existence in this whole realm of things. You know what I'm saying? And I, and I, and I'm, I'm standing on that. Um, what you do have to do is be educated, be socially aware. And goddamn, you know that have you gotta have to know how to put words together, man. You can't be no fucking cornball ass nigga. Let's just say that, all right? Mm -hmm. But no, you don't have to be Johnny the Killer, because who the fuck is Johnny the Killer making money for? I mean, making music for? You know what I'm saying? You didn't kill all these people. Like, who are you, bro? You know what I'm saying? Who are you besides the nigga that's promoting smut? You don't get me started, man. There's a lot of smut promotion going on, and it's watered down the elements. He, <clears throat> like I said, man, I wrote my first rap in 1989. I got more than 10,000 hours vested in this shit. I think I'm an expert. I've seen the fluctuation of the game. I've seen how the game did the wiggle one, two, right? So since I know that, I, I, at once upon a time, you had a choice. Like, you can go to this nigga over here and listen to him and find out what it's like to live in Queens, New York. You can go listen to this nigga over here and find out what it's like to grow up in Watts. And then these two niggas sound totally different. You know what I'm saying? They have a certain dialect that they use. Man, that doesn't even exist in rap no more. You can't tell a Chicago nigga from a New York nigga from a Kansas City nigga. They all dress the same. They all rap the same. Hip hop has lost its authenticity. It's lost its voice, man. And guess what? Today's my birthday, 816. Don't forget that. My birthday is the area code. And I made a pledge to myself, man, as a 44-year-old man. And I know I look fly and everything, but I'm old in wisdom, right? Man, I'm going to keep rapping. I'm going to keep putting positive energy out into the universe. Now, I ain't no... I'm, 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 I'm a dude with some street background. So I'm going to talk about what I know, all right? I'm not here to, quote, unquote, save the world. I'm here to uplift, educate, enlighten, and uh, make some motherfucking cocksucking cash. Yeah, yeah, that's what's up. Okay, so uh, what do you think about all this violence in Kansas City? What, what, what do you think is the cause of all this violence? Man, it's a lot of elements, man. You know, it, it's funny to me that the blanket solution, they say, well, we need more police, right? And you give us more police, and they say there's too many police. Niggas, bro. Yeah. That's right. Uh, that's, that's okay. Why. So, bro. so, so you hear that? You got one important element, man. Niggas is financially fucking distraught out here, right? Mm -hmm. You got that. You got people out here that exist that are products of broken homes. They haven't been raised properly. See, nobody's born anything. 
Nobody's born. Nigga, I wasn't born no fucking rapper. You know what I'm saying? I picked up a pen one day and I wrote a rap and that motherfucker corny as hell. I still remember it. It's corny as fuck, okay? But I liked what I was doing. I kept doing it and I became good at it, all right? Motherfuckers ain't, ain't just waking up just good at and perfect at anything. So you got to teach your child how to be a, grow to be a man. You got to teach your child how to grow to be a great woman as she's a young girl. These kids aren't being taught that. They're just being put out in the world. They look like adults. They have the age of an adult. They don't have a mindset. They don't have the tools to be capable to take on adult issues that they're going to be faced with. You know what I'm saying? So you got that. You got the fucking rap music, all right, that's being pumped over our airwaves. And I. it's interesting with that because... I talk about that and, and motherfuckers act like I'll be saying that rappers is telling a motherfucker to do something. Nah, this music affects your subconscious, right? So if you're sad, you're having, you know, you're thinking about a deceased loved one, you can play some music that's sad that can take you deeper into that thought, or you can also play something that can take you to a higher level of vibration. I be, I used to tell niggas, when we was young and we had to ride down on some niggas, niggas wasn't doing that shit listening to Usher. Man. Niggas wasn't listening to church music. No, no. Niggas was going to listen to something that was going to propel their mindset. Like, we got to get these niggas. Yeah. So the music has a profound impact on how you fucking interact, how you think. Listen, man. Bitches ain't shit but hoes and tricks. Lick on these nuts and suck that dick. Man, that's some hardcore shit. That song was implanted in me when I was a little boy. And guess what? It had me thinking, bitches ain't shit. And I was growing up telling a woman, bitch, you ain't shit. Wow. My dad didn't teach me that. And my mom sure the fuck didn't teach me that. Hip hop was like my dad. Ain't that a bitch? Mm-hmm. So, so rap is basically raising, raising niggas Man, out you here. goddamn right. And that's why when I went to federal prison, that's the first book that I, that I wrote. Was a book called Hip Hop Was Like a Dad. And speaking of that, we're going to drop that link for y'all. And we're going to make sure that, you know, y'all know how to order that. I got a book called Hip Hop Was Like a Dad. It's a fictional story about a young man who was raised in Kansas City, right here in this neighborhood. Uh -huh. And it takes you through his life. He was raised by uh, a Black Panther father and a biracial mother from the South. And his father hated rap music, but when his father died, rap music kind of stepped in and completed the task of raising this young man. And he ended up in prison only to realize that hip hop was his father. It's an interesting read. I'm not gonna give away the story, but you can find it on Amazon. And like I said, we're gonna drop that motherfucking link because I am a black writer and I'm responsible for telling the narrative for us. Yeah, yeah, that's what's up. Okay. Uh do you feel like you can make more money working a job or, or owning a business than you can hustling in the streets or in the trap house? Man, I'm not one to give financial advice because I come from a drug world where you be a method. You blow money fast, you know what I'm saying? So I, I'm, I'm still trying to recover from that mentality. That's a mentality. Yeah. So when it comes to finances, that shit is, is contingent upon your fucking mentality. So that's the best advice. You know, you have to have to have a, a uh, your financial aptitude gotta be at its motherfucking apex. It's gotta be sharp. Stay sharp, nigga, and get money. That's all I'm gonna tell you, man. I know that's cliche and it's kind of vague, but mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm okay. gonna just tell you to save money, get it, and don't be frivolous and fucking frisky and fucking chase women with it and, you know, buy a whole bunch of sex and all that shit, all right? Okay, that's what's up, that's what's up. So, uh, you was close friends with uh, Fat Tone. Yeah, that's right? my guy, man. Yeah, do you have uh, any stories, anything you want to share with KC about the guy? Man, I'm going to give you maybe one or two, but I ain't going to just give you all of my Fat Tone stories because our relationship transcends beyond rap. Okay. A lot of motherfuckers don't know, and I'm standing on this 10 toes down. It's a few people that's, that's deceased that can't confirm this, but it's people that's alive that know this. I inspired Fat Tone to rap. You know what I'm saying? Back when he was a, a, a young nigga. We ain't, he ain't too many years behind me. But he didn't rap when we was growing up. We used to go skating and shit. And, and, at the Grandview Skate Land back in the day on Saturdays from 7 to 11. And our mamas would drop us off. Now his, his, his uncle, his mama's brother, and my auntie, my mama's sister, they dated for years. So me and Fat Tone had like a really, you know what I'm saying, close relationship coming up as kids. 
And not only that, they stayed across the street from my grandfather on 54th and Garfield, which explains my whole connection to a lot of niggas from the 50s, but that's another story. So, you know, we, we, we came up rapping and doing the whole skating ring thing, house parties and rapping on people's pagers and voicemails and shit growing up. And um, our first time where we kind of took things public was in 1997. We did, a, we did a record called Major and Federal for this uh, uh, compilation called Midwest Mobbing. It was produced by this dude named Turk. You know what I'm saying? Turk was like an old school D-boy nigga back in the day, you know what I'm saying? And was just trying to get his feet wet with promotions and shit. So um, <clears throat> he came to me and Fat Tone and, and he, uh, he um, told us like, hey, I want to get a song with y'all. So he, I actually got paid for that song. Fat Tone didn't get paid. I think the nigga paid me like two fucking eight balls, man. And mm -hmm. I'm still kind of holding a little resentment. That motherfucker paid me two eight balls and some hard for doing that goddamn song. I think I song. remember that track because it was on like a mix CD or yeah. a compilation, compilation or something. Yeah, compilation, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that motherfucker gave me goddamn two eight balls, man. So street value of that was about fucking four hundred dollars back then, man. You know what I'm saying? So I had to fucking risk my life to get the money that I made to. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, but bad. shout out to Turk though, man. I, I love you, man. We like family. But uh, that, when we went to the studio that day, me and Fat Tone, we didn't have no money. We young and shit. And I had a few dollars on me. We was hungry. So somebody was going to Burger King. And I was like, Fat Tone, you hungry? He was like, yeah. So I, I, I could only order a value meal. So I told the nigga, we're going to split the burger. We're going to split the fries. And we're going to split the drink. We was on homeboy time. So the person, I'm in the booth. I forget who was getting the food. I don't know who the fuck this was. I think it was Sunday. I don't know. Somebody came back with the food and I'm in the booth and I see Fat Tone like really like smashing the fries. You know what I'm saying? Eating them real fast and I come out. I'm like, damn, cuz you, you supposed to split the fries. I looked in the bag. The fries, damn, they're gone. So he trying to get the bag so we can get the burger. I said, nah, I took the bag and I smashed that motherfucker. And I smashed it. I said, nigga, ain't neither one of us eating. That nigga said, man, you crazy. You crazy. I smashed everything together and I gulped the pot. It was a wrap. Ain't nobody eating, nigga. Ain't nobody eating the burger, not even me. And, and, and like another situation, me and my manager had a spot out in Leewood. And uh, my manager was in Mexico. I got the spot to myself, so I picked Fat Tone up to come out to the crib to write. This nigga said he had to use the bathroom. So he go use the bathroom, he come back upstairs, we writing. I drop the nigga off. I come back home, I'm cleaning up, I go in the bathroom. Man, this nigga done shitted all over the toilet, man. Shitted everywhere, man. Fucked up the toilet, toilet clogged up. And he didn't even fucking tell me, man. He didn't even tell me. So. For a long time, man, I was calling him Shitty McFats. The nigga name was Shitty McFats, man. Cause like we had stopped at McDonald's. That's what it was. We had stopped at McDonald's on the way to my crib, and I, I blamed it on the McDonald's. I'm like, nigga, you ate that fucking McDonald's and and exploded on my fucking toilet in this mini mansion out in Leewood, nigga. Nigga, and I, and, and I gotta have this motherfucking uh, 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 Yankee come through and clean this shit up. Yeah, it was crazy, though. But that was my guy, man. We, we got a lot of history together. I used to bring Fat Tone to the corner up on 43rd Street, stand out there with us in front of Blue Valley, you know what I'm saying, and show him what that, that crip life was about when a nigga was running with some dangerous individuals back in the 90s, some dangerous motherfuckers. Yeah. All right. Uh, what are your thoughts about people that live in the hood? Do you think they can uh, escape poverty with a job? Or do you feel like they're in the hood by choice? Or, or how do you feel about that? Man, you know, I tell people all the time. Hey, man, do yourself a favor. Take a look in the mirror. You look like your decisions. And a motherfucker got to have a deep mind to understand that I'm talking about your existence. Look at your existence in the mirror. It's a result of your decisions, dog. So if you don't have a car... There's some type of decisions that you made that cause you don't have that. If you don't have a house, if your house is not up to par, I don't judge nobody that live in the hood. I'm from the hood. You know what I'm saying? The hood is just a place that we nicknamed it. This is a, actually a community. You know what I'm saying? Real, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart, nigga. All right, all right, all right. All right, we back at, we back at this thing. Um, you know it, you know it. 
Okay, um, what about um, when uh, Twan and Young T and them, they shouted you out on that song, Rather Major, on that Swell L track? That was you that, and your brother they were shouting out, right? Hey, let me tell you something about Swell L, man. Let me tell you something about Swell L. That's, that's a dude that don't, he don't even get the credit that he deserved in Kansas City, man. This dude is a North Side real legend. Like, he really, man, Swell L is the first dude outside of this neighborhood that put me in the studio. It was Timmy Powell right here at this house. He had a studio and all that over there. He used to, you know, bring out the shit. You remember those days, uh, Killer, you know what I'm saying? Nigga bringing that shit out, you feel me? But, uh, man, Swell L, man, actually... So he met me like he knew I was fucking with Rich the Factor. Things with Rich was kind of moving slow. I was learning a lot of shit fucking with Rich. Swell L like shit, fuck that, and put me on a song, man. And it kind of, it kind of boosted my credibility because man, once upon a time, man, the only niggas that was publicly rapping, like that had a name, was niggas from the North Side, niggas from the South Side Posse, and my niggas from the 57th Street and Blood niggas from over there. You know what I'm saying, Tech Nine and. Big Scoob and T-Will and all them niggas, they hold crew, you know what I'm saying? But outside of that, man, wasn't nobody really having no name growing up like that. These dudes, because Swell L was one of them dudes, you know what I'm saying? I'm surprised he don't get the recognition, the same type of recognition as Rich. Swell L, the intellect too, man. That nigga went to college. That nigga ain't no fucking dummy, man. That, that's a smart ass nigga. He just played the background. He real low key. But yeah, yeah man, fucking with the North Side niggas, man, that kind of really took my career to another level. Like, but it made, it, it made niggas in, around here kind of feel some kind of way because, you know, Rich the Factor, an icon in the city. So, you know, I had changed my name from Little Rob to Young Rob for a while, you know what I'm saying? And I'm running around this motherfucker talking like Rich, like, yeah, what's up, man? Yeah, East Side, man, Trey Nine, Four Trey, man. Yeah, man, like that, man, Major Factor, man. You know what I'm saying? And, Niggas like, man, you talking like Rich. You even dressing like the North Pole niggas because back then, you know what I'm saying, North Pole niggas would wear like some Docker slacks creased up with some fucking Rockport Rock boots <laughs> and some fucking in a white T-shirt. You know what I'm saying? With a yeah, KC cap. Stafford Polo. Stafford Polo T-shirt, extra long. You know what yeah. I'm saying? And you know, some creased up Dockers. That was the look. But niggas from over here, niggas wore Dickies, T-shirts and flannels and Cortezes. You know what I'm saying? Niggas didn't dress like that. So I'm coming through with starch motherfucking khakis, calling myself Young Rob, and I done adapted to this motherfucking North Pole colloquialism and shit. <laughs> niggas is like, man, you didn't lost your motherfucking mind. But shout out to Rich, though, because that goes to show you there's no rapper here that motherfuckers is trying to talk like. Motherfuckers ain't trying to talk like Tech Nine. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of white people that want to rap like him. But motherfuckers want to rap about the shit that rich rap about. They want to talk like that nigga. They want to be street like that nigga. That's a fucking icon, okay? Now, Tech Nine's a motherfucking icon, too. Because these niggas ain't, get, ain't, ain't got bitches tattooing their name on their titties. Shout out to Tech Nine for all the tit tattoos. I think that nigga do that song. Areola, bitches pop them motherfuckers up. Them motherfucking titties get the bouncing and shit. Nice ass nips. You know what I'm saying? Hey, that's just yeah. awesome. That's what's up. But yeah, man, when we heard them shouting you out on that song, man, you was like, it was like legendary because everybody was playing that, man. So yeah. your clout had to be on another level. It at was. That I point, was so man. young, you know what I'm saying? Then in like school, like after even even through Rich, I had like different types of connections with the dudes that was around him, like Slicks. Slicks got yeah. you. Rest in peace to Slicks got you. That that nigga's mama, you know what I'm saying, had a house on 30, 38th and like Ask you or something like that. That's right in this motherfucking neighborhood. That's walking distance right up the street. So when Slicks would be at his mama house, I'm networking with him, going over there. We writing raps and shit. So me and Slicks had our own relationship outside of Rich. This was back, man. Listen, man. I'm going to tell you how I met that nigga, dog. I was just a young nigga trying to find my way. I knew I wanted to be a rapper. But I wanted to take it to a next level. And I kept hearing about this dude, Rich the Factor. I was listening. It was a nigga named Buzzy from Faux Trey. He the nigga that introduced me to that nigga's music. So I had memorized this nigga's music. I loved it. So he had a phone number on the back. And I called that motherfucker. And I was like, hey, what's up? My name Lil Rob. I'm, I stay at 3919 Norton. And I spit him a rap. That nigga called right back. That nigga said, all right, man. I'm on my way to see you, man. That nigga pulled up on a Sunday morning. I was getting ready for church. That nigga came in. My mama like, who is that? I said, that's Rich the Factor. She like, I don't care. 
Oh, what are you doing in here? I said, Mama, he a rapper. That nigga interrupted that nigga like, hey, ma'am, your son can rap, and I want to take him to the studio. She said, he got to go to church right now. I don't give a fuck about no studio. I was embarrassed. I'm trying to come off like a little gangster. You know what I'm saying? I'm 14. It's 1994. A young nigga. I'm trying to impress this old ass nigga. You know what I'm saying? So here come my brother in his church clothes. Here come Greg with his with, with pictures of us in the club throwing up crip signs and shit. Just show rich like, nigga, we ain't church boys. You know what I'm saying? That shit was it's funny looking back at it at hindsight. You know what I'm saying? So that marked the beginning of uh, me and Rich's relationship, you know what I'm saying? Us being connected. We never put out no albums together. I think I recorded one song at his house down at 1004, 10th and Park. They call that shit 1004. I used to catch yellow cabs down to that motherfucker all the time. This was before Uber and all that shit. They was jumping out of yellow cabs and shit, you know what I'm saying? Go down there and he had the producers in there. The niggas would just be in there writing and smoking weed. That's how I got connected with Rap and Twine. Young T, you know what I'm saying? White Mike, motherfucking Big Mark, you know what I'm saying? Rest in peace to him. All kind of motherfuckers from the north side, you know what I'm saying? Met Weed before he died, you know what I'm saying? I met Lil Donut, you know what I'm saying? Rich's little brother. So I, that, that, that rap shit took me outside of my neighborhood, bro. That's what it did. I would have never messed with them niggas. Niggas from, from a whole different part of town. The niggas grew up in the projects. They had a whole different outlook on culture. Like, even when Rich, when Rich took me through a spin in the neighborhood, I'll never forget that nigga had a green 72 colors on some all-go backs. You remember that yeah, shit? I remember that. I, we riding through the hood. There was some niggas on 39th and South Bend. They blew it up. But they got jewelry and shit on. That nigga said, man, look at these niggas, man, out here selling crack with all this goddamn jewelry on their neck, man. These niggas is jokes, man. Yeah. That's when I realized, man, you ain't supposed to be out here looking like that. Them yeah. North Pole niggas. They on that grit hustle, that grimy hustle, nigga. They wearing their t-shirts inside out, hair nappy, but they pockets be lumpy as a motherfucker. Shoes be dirty and curled up. They don't give a fuck. They got about 4,000 that they made in their pocket just that day. Selling pieces, you know what I'm saying? In the project, down at TV Watkins and all that shit. So, so, everybody was, well, Rich was known for, in the 90s, he was known for smoking that good, you know, the good exotic stuff, yeah, endo, kush, that all that yeah, shit in the nineties. Yeah. And like back then, niggas was just smoking Reggie, you Man, know that, that hard Reggie. Chocolate top with me. Nigga. He was, you know, that's what I'm saying. So uh, we know you you went down to the factor's house. What was it like, you know, being able to go down to his house and smoke with that man and being associated with one of the hottest rappers in town? What was it like at that in the 90s at that point in time? It's good. It's, it's a dope that you asked me that because I can answer it from this grown-up perspective looking back at the little boy me. Nigga, I thought I made it, nigga. <laughs> I thought I made it, nigga. <laughs> nigga, I, I, nigga, I went from wanting to be a pediatrician yeah. to goddamn, I, I'm going to be a goddamn rapper, nigga. I'm, I'm major factor records, nigga. I'm Major Factor, nigga. My name is Young Rob, nigga. You know what I'm saying? This was before R.O.B. Reflection of Brilliance, before Riches Over Bitches. It was Young Rob, nigga. You know what I'm saying? So, I um, I think he saw that. And he saw that I was a young nigga that had the wrong perspective of the game because Rich, what niggas don't know, Rich is a lyricist, man. That nigga can rap. But this is a project, nigga, that was hustling, gritting, fucking with niggas out in Cali. They helped the nigga JT the bigger figure, helped the nigga put out a game, showed him the game, and he never looked back. He never did another album with them niggas. He was major factor from after that album on. That's how we got pole position and all that shit. So his whole thing, I would be like, I want to sign. Let me tell you something, man. If that nigga would have offered me a 10 album deal and took all my goddamn publishing and had me sign that contract on a goddamn napkin, I would have signed that shit. I ain't know no better. I just looked up to him. I, 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 I liked what he was doing. So he never, this nigga would tell me, all right, I'm going to pick you off from school tomorrow, man. Make sure you had that contract. He would tell me to write my own contract. Man, that man was teaching me a valuable lesson. I didn't understand it as a teenager. He's basically saying, you're going to write your own contract to be a slave for me. You can do this yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think what Rich has taught people has flew a lot over their heads. A lot of rappers want niggas to do shit for them. I wanted Rich to do shit for me. Nah, Rich is a, a nigga that is, is showing you to be self-sufficient. 
His self sufficiency is it shows in his work, man. This nigga, yeah, this nigga, this nigga got all kind of albums, man. Fat Tone is the only nigga that I know, bro. And I'm ashamed that I can't say this about myself, but I got caught up in the in the drug business. But Fat Tone is the only nigga that I know that followed the Rich to Factor formula, bro. As far as constantly putting out music, I can't even put Tech Nine in that category because. He's so much of a different rapper and he was supported by a different type of machine. These niggas is grassroots type of niggas. Tech Nine was that when he was with Diamond. When he got with Travis, his, his shit, the dynamic of what he was yeah. doing was changing because it got bigger. But these dudes was like talking to the community. People riding around the community listening to their music. They don't listen to Tech like that. He doesn't have the message for the people in the community. He has a broader, yeah, he, his shit is like global. These niggas is talking to the inner cities of America. You know what I'm saying? With their messages or whatever. And Fat Tone followed that Rich the Factor formula. He followed the circuit that he was using, fucking with the Bay Area niggas and all that. And uh, I think, you know, I slept on that. It was a lot of niggas that I, I think the niggas in his own camp might have slept on that. Niggas that grew up under his tutelage that didn't follow the formula that was laid out for them to become what he is now. He's not responsible for nobody's success or failure. You know, it's you, motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Rich is the best. Don't get no bigger than that. Nah, man. That's my nigga. Math and math. That's my nigga. That boy is real. Don't get nothing bigger than that. Who is it? Who? Tell everybody. Uh huh. Who the fuck who you are? If you got music for you, me, everybody. Yeah. Turn your heart to the fucking to the dime block. You know what I'm saying? The five sure. one. To God. All B. This nigga right here, y'all looking at right here, reflection, reflection of brilliance. You know what I'm saying? Been that nigga since I've been knowing since a young buck coming up. Yeah, they don't know, like, when a nigga, a nigga used to go by R.O.B. See, I learned how to rap from a nigga that he's from Faux Trey. He, he, he kind of contributed to that whole Faux Trey 9 thing. Because I met him over here. I met him through Fat Shines at the house on 39th and Kissington. But the nigga claimed Faux Trey, but he was tied in heavy. His name was Rich Dog. And uh, Rich Dog was a colorful ass nigga. The nigga had all kind of diamonds and shit in his mouth. The shit was fake, but I was a kid. I thought the shit was cool, and I didn't know it was fake. The nigga had all kind of, uh, what they call them tattoos that niggas get to burn? Well, what, the ones that you burn it. What the tattoos that you burn on? What them called? Yeah, what them, what's them called when niggas do that? They don't branded. Get, branded. Branded. The nigga had all kind of pitchforks and crip signs branded on him and shit. This nigga was a, just a phenomenal nigga. The nigga could break dance. The nigga could sing. The nigga could rap. The nigga had a fucking hell of a story. The nigga was a foster kid. The nigga had lived in different cities and shit. He had a fucking amazing story. And he was older than me. How I started rapping, bro, this is a real fucking story. I memorized all this nigga shit. That's how much I looked up the Rich Diggity Dog. Yeah. And I would go to school and spit his shit and tell people that it was mine. Yeah, you're right. Boy, I said that shit so much that I was forced to write my own fucking rap. Man, I started writing. When I got confident, I went to Rich Dog. I said, man, I want to rap with you. He liked what I was doing. We became a group. We became a group. Pipe it down, pipe it down. You gonna be alright. Or or me? You gonna be alright. We in the hood, yeah, man. 39th Street. 39. Yeah. Old school. 39, baby. Yeah. 39. Baby. All right, so check it out, man. Check it out. Yeah. So um I'm memorizing this nigga shit. I started writing my own shit. I tell him he liked my shit. We started a group. It's Rich Dog and Little Rob. That's how I started. I don't know if you remember that. He called himself Rich Dog. I was Little Rob the Mailman because, nigga, I was chasing that mail as a little boy killer. You know that. Standing right there on 39th and Jackson. Turn the camera on 39th and Jackson. Can you see up there? You can't see up there. Nigga, it was a fucking shop up there, nigga. Niggas know. When that shop closed, nigga, it's free game. Nigga, it's weed everybody serves. Getting Man, everybody getting money around this mother. Ain't nobody arguing. It serves everywhere, bro. Which area do you feel like had the worst or the best influence on the people of KC, Chicago, the West Coast, or the East Coast? The East Coast had the best influence on hip hop because it produced the most 
various forms of hip hop. That's just in my opinion. Yeah, on Kansas City. Oh, on Kansas City. Yeah. Say, well, state that question again. Okay. Which area do you feel like had the worst and best influence on the people of KC? Chicago, West Coast, or the East Coast? I can't say worst or best. I can say who had the most influence. Who on had the world. most influence? During my generation, it was the Bay Area. During this generation, it's Chicago. Okay, okay. What do you think about Chicago having a having a um, having a strong influence on these young people in Kansas City? Man, let me tell you something, man. Chicago is the home of the fucking Black Renaissance way back in the in the nineteen twenties or thirties, I think. Chicago is rich in artistic history, bro. They're just giving us one side of Chicago. Don't forget Comet from Chicago, Kanye West is from Chicago, Kid Cudi. I mean, uh, it's it's so many different people from Chicago that are true musicians, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not gonna just say that Little Dirt is Chicago. Everybody in Chicago don't wanna kill each other, you know what I'm saying? Everybody don't wanna see violence happen every day. I'm not from Chicago, I'm not gonna speak on the politics there, you know what I'm saying? But from the outside looking in, man, I believe Chicago is a beautiful city. I got family there, bro. And uh, they produce some great art, man, and you know, don't forget, man, you only know about Chicago from what you see in the media. And the media's a master manipulator. Okay, okay. See, I am the media. Hey, man, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tell me this. You know what I'm saying? What are your thoughts on men that don't care? What are your thoughts on men that don't take care of their kids? Man, it's fucked up. Every man has a story, so I'm not going to judge nobody. Okay, okay. Okay, so. Uh, I think every man should be in their children's lives. But again, we're opening up a whole can of worms when it comes to that because parenting is a two-sided street, you know what I'm saying? The kids need both parents, you know, and they need cooperation between both parents. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you feel like men that use violence to control women are cowards? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay. I don't support no motherfucking pimp. Uh -huh. I don't support no motherfucking pimp, nigga. I'd rather pimp this Yankee-ass system. Instead of pimping a black woman, you yeah. get black market money. Yeah, man. I'm gonna pimp this system. I'm gonna pimp myself. I'm gonna pimp. I'm gonna pimp my pen. Yeah. I'm gonna pimp my motherfucking pen. You feel me? Yeah, feel me? And talk all them riddles them niggas be talking. Yeah. That's some corny ass shit to me. That's, 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 that's story. Okay, uh, KC finally has a, a mainstream rapper. Are you proud of Sleazy World Gold success? I don't even know that dude. I, you talking about that dude? The uh, rapper from here, because people feel like Kansas City is really, we really doing good as a, as a, as a, and you know, we can be acknowledged as a big city since we got a mainstream rapper. Now, Sleazy World Go. Now, I'm, I, he's a media guy. This guy's a media guy, so he's fucking trapping me. He wants me to exert my real opinion about that music. Man, that shit sucks. Hey, is he really from here, though? No, no, he's not I, even from here. A lot of people say he's from two cities, but he claimed two cities. He claimed Kansas City, but here's the deal, man. We're talking about rap music, hip hop, the culture, right? Yeah. Man, for one, man, this dude promotes death. I don't, I can't listen to that shit. I just heard some shit on the radio. A nigga talking about I'm gonna give a nigga a shit bag and all this stuff. There's no woman that can jam to that unless she's like super low vibrational. And I don't want a woman like that around me. I don't want my sons listening to that either. Man, I, I like to sit down with that young man and kind of figure out where's the source of this. Is you doing this for money? Do you understand the impact that you're having on the youth, man? Because you, yeah, I don't know, man, but you know, I can have a private conversation with him. I ain't gonna slander the man, but I don't support that type of music. I think that music contributes to the negative mindset of our youth and it propels them to engage in criminal behavior because it sounds like that he validates that shit. I feel like the one song he had where he's shouting out all the guns and stuff and he took DMX's concept. He should have got a fucking cosign from the NRA or yeah. some of these gun companies because he had a message for them, not for us. I don't support that shit, man. That's, he signed with KKK Records. Oh, KKK? Yeah, his CEO wears a fucking white coat and white cap on his face. And he yeah. said, nigga, get out there and fucking do that. I got a fucking chain for you when you're done. I need you to promote black death and I got a fucking new Rolls Royce for you. Hey, man, you can't do ROB like that. I'm a reflection of brilliance, not bullshit. Now, nigga can fight me about financials. You got this, I got, you don't got this, I got that. Hey, man, man makes the money. Money never made the man. So niggas who think like that can go suck a curved AIDS-infested donkey dick. That way, that way. That's what's up, that's what's up. Okay, um, at one point in time,
was one of the hottest rappers in KC. Nigga, I still am. And and still are, and still legendary to this day. Are you satisfied with your career, or do you feel like you could have did more? Man, I'm not no coulda, woulda, shoulda, nigga. I'm a nigga that know how to look in the mirror and say, man, you a result of your own fucking choices. So what I do is I just keep working. I keep working, and I try to, you know, when you driving down the highway, right, it's imperative that you glance in each rear view mirror and your main rear view mirror to kind of look and see what's going on behind you. Mm -hmm. But if you look at that motherfucker too long, you're going to fear it and run into something. Life is the same way, man. I kind of glance at that shit on what I did in the past, but I got my eyes set on what's in the future pretty much now. Try to stay in the moment. So I ain't going to beat myself up. You know, if that, you know, if I start entertaining what I could have, would have, should have, I'm gonna introduce myself into depression. And the only time you in, you depress is when you fucking dwell on the past. You know what I'm saying? Only time you got anxiety is when you dwell on the future. So fuck all that. Let's live in the now. Have a good day. Okay, uh, what's the craziest situation you seen while being in the hood? A nigga in this park that smoked some motherfucking PCP and that nigga ran from one side of this motherfucker to the other with his dick <laughs> flopping. The nigga was butt naked, screaming loud as a motherfucker. Yeah, that was some nuki egg, ooky, 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 kooky, for nuki ass shit. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, a lot of PCP usage around this motherfucker. That's what's up. Okay, how'd you get uh, Ron Ron on the song? Because he's like, he's almost like that. Pretty much like the Andre 3000 at KC. Man, it was easy, man. Ron Ron is, you know, he's somebody I went to school with. We went to the Purcell Performance School of Arts. So we knew about each other on the art side back then. And then I knew about Ron Ron Street Ties too. So it was easy for us to come together. I had an idea uh, called, uh, the name of the song was Life in the Underworld. And it was just talking about us existing in, in the underworld. That's what's up, that's what's up. Okay, uh, how do you feel about KC's dating scene? Do you feel there's some good church going women out here? Or is all these girls out here trying to be a hot girl summer or a stallion? How do you feel about these, these Kansas City and Kansas women? Well, I haven't had sex and dated all of them, so I can't speak for them collectively. But I'll tell you this. <sighs> I've been conscious and aware of the women I've been sleeping around with this year. And man, I still have yet to meet a woman that has woke up with me and got on her knees and prayed. I know we might have did some wild shit the night before, but you know, motherfuckers ain't getting up and praying in the morning, man, and it makes me kind of look at them differently. So I'm, I don't, there's not, I don't, I haven't met any, I meet a lot of pretty women, but the peas are fucked up. I need mean, pretty and praying, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, can the homeless be helped, or do you feel like those resources should be invested into helping the youth? Well, if we gotta figure out how can the homeless help themselves, let's start there. And then once they figure that out, then the community can figure out how that they can help. Cause you, you know, you have to be self-sufficient, man. Some people need a boost, but you gotta, you gotta take initiative. You gotta have some type of initiative. Um, I think, you know, collectively as a community, man, you know, we can attack homelessness and education. You know, our education system is fucking twisted. Like I said, man, to, to change what's going on out here, you gotta fight things on so many different fronts. You got education, healthcare, entertainment, um, fatherless homes. You got so many different dynamics, the police, all these different things, man. Listen, the world, well, this country operates and makes a lot of money off of African-American ignorance, all right? We, our ignorance employs people. You know, there's more police because of our ignorance. There's more judges, more lawyers, more people that want to get into the criminal justice field because of our ignorance. And if we stop our ignorance, then we twist up the economy. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's somebody somewhere that needs us to keep being niggerish because it makes them super rich. Mm hmm And the thing I find, a lot of people... You know, you catch a lot of people acting like a nigga on the internet, and it's, it's, I'll say this, it is profitable. It's a profitable business to, to act like a nigga on camera. A lot of people don't like to act like that on camera, you know, because I film a lot. A lot of people don't like to do the, you know, the, the nigga shit on camera, and you wouldn't think it would be like that, but it yeah. is. A lot of people, when they when it comes to doing, like, nigga shit, you know, acting like a nigga on camera, people want to get paid for that. Now, what? how do you feel about drill or funk music? Um, um, is it, is it, 
is it um okay it used to be gangsters but now everybody want to be a demon or a devil what do you feel about rappers making words like demons cool well when i hear them say that i don't think that they're aware of the power of the spoken word and what comes out of a man's mouth is an overflow of what's stored in his heart you know what i'm saying so it's a lot of darkness filled up inside of these young men for them to you know think that that's music because who the fuck are y'all making that shit for you know what I'm saying? Like, who the fuck are y'all making that shit for? Like, who's the audience? You know, I'm making songs about this neighborhood. Everything that I saw, this ops, ops, ops. Man, I didn't left out a whole segment of society that I could. I ain't, that shit is, that shit is, that shit is. But here's the weird thing. It's like selling bad food in a community because you don't hear that shit on white radio stations. You know, I noticed, man, there's no more love in R&B and there's no more rap in hip hop. But when you go listen to fucking... The white rappers, they can make the type of songs that are deep. Like Macklemore, I like Macklemore, actually. But that nigga Sex can- Sex and violence sells. Sex and violence sells. This mother, we just talked about that. This country is built on violence. Yes, yeah. And sex and pillaging and fucking- Everything, this whole country- Vitriolic behavior, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, of course, man, that shit's gonna get gobbled up by the, by the naive consumer. But there's a lot of con spiritually conscious people out here that, that ain't with that shit. And I'm one of them. That shit's not getting played in my car. One of the things that I do when I date a woman is I say, here, baby, you control the radio. Listen to whatever you want to listen to. Man, that woman's being evaluated. She, her music selection is being evaluated because it's letting me know where her soul resonates. You feel me? Yeah. That's what's up. So you don't, you know, you know when the camera goes off and you feeling good, you don't, you don't play drill songs or funk music or none of that. Nah, Tupac. Okay. It's all lies. Okay. Oh, no, you the greatest shit I ever wrote. Yeah, I play that. <laughs> all right. So uh, you, uh, you just dropped a book. Uh, tell KC about this book you dropped. It was called Hip Hop Is Like a Dad. Um, it's one of three books that I wrote in prison that just dropped today on my birthday, August 16th, 816 day. That's my city's area code, if y'all didn't know. I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, not Kansas, but shout out to the 913. But we talking about the 816, Kansas City, Missouri, where we shine like jewelry. Yes. So the book is called Hip Hop is Like a Dad. I wrote it while I was incarcerated. And um, really, it just kind of started off with a conversation I was having with a prisoner that nigga asked me, hey, What's going on in the city, Rob? Why these niggas killing each other? And I answered by saying, I don't know, nigga. These niggas ain't got no daddies, man. Hip hop is these niggas' daddies. And that sparked the idea. So okay. it just tells the story of a young man raised in Kansas City whose father died in hip hop. Hip hop music replaced the messages that his father was trying to instill in him. Okay, okay. That's what's up. I'm gonna have to check that out. Yeah, do that. We're gonna share the link, man. Make sure okay. we share that link, dog. Yeah, we'll put the link under let this your, video. Uh, viewers know. Hey, what they say, like, scribe, and subscribe, yeah. whatever they say. I don't know. How to do I'll that. never say that. I, I, you don't ever say that. I'll never say that. Share, like, and subscribe. No, yeah. it's the other. You guys, you got to do it in order. Like, scribe, is it? Wait, I don't know, man. I ain't no podcast nigga. But listen, <laughs> fuck with my nigga, man. You know what I'm saying? To support this book, support me. Fuck with me. I'm ROB, Reflection of Brilliance. And uh, I'm a writer, not a biter. I put myself in others. Okay, uh, how do you feel about people doing drills and getting on social media and joking and bragging about stepping on the ops? Well, it just makes the FBI's job a lot better, the district attorney's job, the detectives, the state detectives. It just makes their fucking puzzle that they got to put together so much more easier, makes their case more concrete. Hey, man, this stuff that these kids are doing is a result of a lack of love that they didn't get at home. They need attention. They need hugs, man. It needs people to tell them, hey, I love you, man. I care about you. Not just tell them, but to actually show them it. This new generation of kids, they, not, they grew up with all kind of electronic devices, but didn't grow up with any uh, genuine love. Man. Well, it's pure. It's the case. A fake love, you can feel it to a thousand miles away. Mm -hmm. You understand? I don't deal with this fake shit. Fake shit can save motherfuckers. Real love don't cost a thing. It's pure as long as it's authentic. Like my nigga all beat. You know what I'm saying? That boy right here, he's a legend. He's on his way to the top. He's gonna fly high, non-stop. This year, that part. Oh, yeah. So, um, R.O., what's the number one place you would tell a tourist 
to visit Wale and KC if they coming in town. Because a lot of people from out of town are going to be watching cause. this. Why you laughing, bro? <laughs> Where are you going to send them you, to? Wait, wait, wait. Give me some hints on this, man. Because you laughing. Because people are going to be watching this. I don't want to say nothing goofy, because you laughing. We're going to tell them. Listen, we're going to tell them to get some gates. All right? Okay. We're going to tell you to get some gates. We're going to tell you to get some. Nah, that ain't that. As long as you didn't say Arthur Bryan's, nigga, yeah, that's just nah, disgusting. Nah, 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 nah. Arthur Bryan's meat is good, but you gotta put gay sauce on it. You feel me? <laughs> so, I know, I know. <laughs> hey, man, this corporation's gonna be like. like that too, though. Listen, man, hold on. gonna have let's, some people heated. Yeah, let's pause real quick because Ali Gates is a friend of mine, bro. Uh, uh, I'm on YouTube with the man. Ain't nothing topping no motherfucking Gates, and this ain't no political statement. Yeah. Yeah. And you can go to Jack Stack. Jack Stack's a great restaurant. I'll be, you know what I'm saying? Black to Kansas City, ain't fucking Gates. But I, I think Kansas City right now, the only tourist attraction that we got for real worth dealing with is the Legends Shopping Center, the Plaza, and the Power and Light District. It's developing. Our city's, you know, bubbling right now, man. We got a lot of shit going on right now, man. By 20, every city has a 2030 plan. And by 2030 this month, we got the, uh, the, World Cup coming in two years, man. Shit, we got some beautiful things going on over there. Okay, uh, for your final question, ROB. What's uh, up with it? What advice would you give somebody that's trying to get rich? Because I know a lot of people watch my videos and they're like, you know, that, that's on their mind. Uh, man, you know, I don't give financial advice. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So if a, if a person's objective is to get rich, let them get rich. They have to find their lane. My objective is to get wealthy. And in order to obtain wealth, we have to provide a service that everybody needs. You know what I'm saying? And to obtain the knowledge on how to reach the levels of wealth, you got to get good mentors. And, hey, man, that's what I've been focused on. Get you some mentors. Get you some, get you some people around you that exhibit a lifestyle that you see yourself living. All right? Yeah, think like the white man have a fortune. Nah, you don't think like the motherfucking white right. man. You don't think no. like the motherfucker. Don't tell that killer. The white man. You think big. Listen, man. Yeah. The black man is the original man. The white That's man right. is thinking like uh, us. What he's the done is create the system that keeps we us We're really suppressed. the one percent, but so, we gave it all back. Yeah. We're gonna like think that, like a black man. We ain't gonna think like no niggas. We ain't thinking like niggas. We thinking like strong black men. Call me mine. Like, yeah. My mouth dry, man. I smoke that motherfucking California weed. I know how it is, you know man. I want to let everybody know this is this is killer right here. He's legendary in his hood. You know, growing up, he was like, you know, pretty much what everybody talked about it was like, you know, like baby, you know. Like I said, it, him having him and Montone in the hood was like having two babies in the hood, man, as far as like from cash money. This man is legendary. Anything you want to say, Killer? Hey, man, I want to say what's up to everybody in the hood. 3900, I want to say what's up to Rob. Invite me to this interview, man. man you my nigga, man. I've been fucking with you since I was a little boy. Man. You know my father, you feel me? You my mama, baby, all man. that. My all brothers, man. all that. We all from the yeah. same block, same hood. Yeah. Man. I want to give thanks to my man. You know how many times this nigga didn't broke me in dice games? Oh, I had to be like, hey, hey killer hey, man, hey, can, hey, I, can hey, I borrow yeah, a couple nah, hundred cuz and hey, man, you just you fucked me up? You know what I'm saying? Hey, that's so, all we do around It's a lot of history, man. It's a lot of history, man. You know, I appreciate, I appreciate you having me on the channel, man. man. And being able to give my perspective, dog, because it's important that you as a black journalist, you give people the opportunity to 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 project alternative perspectives and not just a one-sided thing, man. I, I see a lot of people, they try to criticize what you're doing, but nigga, you doing what you're doing, nigga, and keep doing what you're doing, and you getting money. That's what I like about what you're doing. You getting motherfucking money, dog. You know what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, money ain't everything, it's the only thing. And nigga, I've been around you, bro. You got a spirit. I don't give a fuck what these niggas say. Nigga, you look like a rock star and shit with all these goddamn tattoos. <laughs> but nigga, you got swag. Your belts is real. Man, you know what I'm saying? Man. I ain't never seen you wear a fake watch in my fucking life, nigga. Yeah. And that's on everything yeah. I love. I always been pulling up Rolexes is this. real. Yeah. I know that for sure, nigga. Nigga, break out paperwork on your ass and everything. Man, you already know yeah. it. You know what I'm saying? Nigga, credit probably at nine ninety nine. <laughs> All right. You gonna, uh, you gonna kick one of them raps in uh, for us or something? Man, let me see, man. You want one of those, man. I got so much on my mind, I gotta get it out. When the stress seems like it's too much, I can't forget about. Praying to my higher power, asking for clarity. Like the path that leads me to spiritual prosperity. In the world full of controversy and bloodthirsty government leaders. Can't believe none of that shit that they feed us. Keep your eyes open, everything ain't what it seems. 
The world ain't been the same ever since COVID-19. How they got money for war but can't feed the poor. Dress me up in God's armor, protect me for what's in store. I got the belt buckle of truth around my waist. I got the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith. I got the breastplate of righteousness, shoes of the gospel, helmet of salvation for times when it get hostile. I vibrate from my crown chakra, having high level conversations with my partners, cause iron sharpens iron. All of us are trying to be the best version of ourselves before we die and get put back into the dirt where all of us came from. Live your life to the fullest up until the day come, but don't sell your soul. God got a plan. All you got to do is listen and trust what he's saying like a navigation system, giving you direction, your spiritual connection worth more than material possessions. This is all Roby, Reflection of Brilliance, 8-16-2024, and I'm out. Good game. Rebel Cardi, now we never look coming 2024. You ready for that new album, 3900, we back. East Side, Kansas City. We in the building. Kill Switch Entertainment, coming soon. Let's get it. That's what's up.